Tumble out of bed, stumble to the kitchen, pour myself a cup of ambition, yawn and stretch and try to come to life. Jump in the shower, the blood starts pumping, out on the street, the traffic sucks, jumping for folks like me on a job from nine to five. Nay, why the hell are you singing that song? I don't know, I'm in a mood. love bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. I also have on sale my wood bangle bundles, okay? Um, first of all, let me just thank everyone who has purchased from my website. Okay, it seems to be the same people, and I appreciate you guys so much. Who is that? Nakia, uh, Taha. Um, if I'm forgetting your name, charge it to my head and not to my heart. I appreciate you guys, but I would like to see some new supporters over there on up top. And if you are not a part of our book club please hit the patreon link below and or the join button here on the youtube and for a small monthly fee of five dollars you babies yes you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the youtube gets it if the youtube gets it now let's continue talking about duke for Kears, my life as a four top. Well, fellas, I got to tell you, I really can't do it. I can't give you the deal, Jay said to us. I asked him why. Otis Smith stepped forward and said, I'll tell you why, because y'all ain't ready for this shit. You got that Detroit swagger and all, but you're not ready to be the kind of businessman it takes to take care of this album. What you say, nigga? I walked over to him, grabbed him by the collar, and dragged him through the president's office y'all okay pause right okay my bad i'm not on camera I, I, I got shit going on right but anyway y'all it seems like the more i read this book the more dookie is looking attractive to me oh, and you know, i've never like uh found one, none of the four tops attractive some of y'all be like oh that levi oh that not even a levi y'all but it's something about that Dookie, y'all. It's like he got that street thug in him that I just be like, ooh, Dookie. Motherfucker, I'll throw you out this window. Ooh! Ooh! I'm getting sweaty right now. Ooh, just thinking about a ninja throwing somebody out the window. He looked ooh. outside to the sidewalk below. We were up on the fourth floor. The fellas were right behind me. They didn't say nothing. It was like, if Duke's going crazy, let him go crazy. You'll cause us a lifetime of grief, telling Jay that. I said, shoving him up against the ledge. Of course, I came to my right mind and I didn't throw him out. Afterwards, when we got back in Lasker's office, he wrapped things up by telling us, you sure ain't going to get a label now. Well, fuck you too, Jay. I said, heading to the door. We'll finish this album. We don't need your help to finish it. Goodbye. We went back in the studio and finished Night Lights Harmony ourselves. Lawrence and I mixed it. We helped master it. They put it out, but they really didn't put it out. They gave it no promotion and it died. Once again, we were looking for a new label. We made a deal with Casablanca. Landed ourselves a new manager and got a nice little advance. With David Wolfert's producing, we made a great album. Tonight, we all loved the way Tonight sounded. We had a lot of fun recording those songs, some in L.A. and some in New York. Again, we felt very good about our new label. 
Casablanca released When She Was My Girl as a single. Right away, it took off becoming a number one R&B hit. It almost made it into the U.S. pop top 10, peaking at number 11. In the U.K., it went to number three. Both the single and the album sold very well. We recorded another Casablanca LP with David Wolfert producing One More Mountain. In 1983, in the midst of our time at Casablanca, a Motown reunion was in the works. Barry wanted to get all his people together for a televised 25th anniversary special, Motown 25. Yesterday, today, forever. It included a segment produced by an impressive top-level Motown executive, Susan DePassi, who also produced TV and film, and Gil Eskew, the arranger we had bought to Motown with the tops performing on stage with The Temptations. As we sang, we were trying to one-up each other, trading songs in a little battle of the bands. Man, next to the Michael Jackson, y'all, tell me what you think, okay? Next Next to the Michael Jackson, which was the greatest performance in my lifetime ever seeing ever, okay? It was like magnanimous to this day when I watch Motown 25 and seeing the Michael Jackson do the moonwalk, it sends me. But right after the Michael Jackson performance was the Temptations Four Tops trade-off. It was amazing, y'all. And then towards the end, they started singing each other's song. Oh, my God, it was amazing. As we sang, we were trying to one-up each other, trading songs in a little battle of the bands. In rehearsals, it felt good. When it was televised, it came off really beautifully. The highlight of the show until Michael Jackson came on stage. We loved it when he performed earlier in the show with the Jackson 5, but when Michael came out by himself, it was mind-blowing. Over the five days we rehearsed Motown 25 at the Santa Monica Civic Center, we only had two dressing rooms. The women had one big dressing room and the men had the other one. For that whole week, we hung out with Marvin Gaye, the Jacksons, the Temps, the Miracles, and other artists. We all had so much fun in the dressing room. They should have had a camera in there for extra footage. The shit talking, the fun, and the jokes were nonstop. At this time, all us Motown acts had gone our separate ways. We hadn't been close for some time. We were all out there busily doing our own thing. The show felt like a big family coming together for a reunion or Thanksgiving. All the guys were playful kind of guys, making bets, pulling pranks, playing poker. We won a little money. Things happened that I just can't talk about. It was crazy fun. See, see, fucker, 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 see, dookie. That's why this book be dry. Michael mostly kept to himself, but every now and then he'd pop in the dressing room and say, you guys are crazy. Once in a quiet moment, he approached Levi and told him that he listened to our songs when he awoke in the mornings and simply loved his voice. But generally, he was so quiet that you hardly even noticed him. Most of us hung around the majority of the day, watching each other rehearse, commenting, going back to the dressing room, messing with each other, and just being together. It was refreshing. Did you be together with the Barry Wilson? Did you tell Mary, Mary, don't pull that stunt with the Diana Ross. Don't do that. When we saw Barry, who didn't really hang around rehearsals, everybody had a chance to say hello and reconnect. Barry approached the tops personally saying, hey, fellas, y'all sounding great and looking great. Y'all ready to come back? Yup, we sure are. We sure more than ready. Well, after this, get in touch with me. In fact, I want to record you and the temps on a song. I'll have someone write something for you. I'd like to do another couple albums, guys. Soon after that, we did go back to Motown one more time. After our first album, Magic, was released in 1985, Barry felt something was missing. He wanted us to start working on another album. We suggested collaborating with HDH again, asking if we could use them to write and produce. Lamont had split. 
from the HDH partnership and Barry was still in the midst of a legal battle with them. But Barry didn't object, saying it was up to us to get them back together if they agreed. I called Eddie. He'd written some songs for us when we were at ABC Dunhill. I'd always stayed in touch with Lamont. Every time I went to LA, I'd go over his house for a good meal. He could cook as good as any chef. So I went over to talk and eat. They all agreed to get back together to write for the tops. Once again, they wrote us some beautiful songs. The album was appropriately titled Back Where I Belong. It included a song with Aretha Franklin, What Have We Got to Lose, which Barry just loved. The album also had several other great songs, including the title song Back Where We Belong and I Just Can't Walk Away, a ballad with a nice feel. But before it came out, Eddie and Barry got into it again another falling out. Motown eventually did put the album out, but they didn't really put it out. No real promotion or anything. We were out of ideas to resurrect our recording career. Our manager, Ron Strasner, wasn't discouraged. He went to Clive Davis, the head of Arista Recordings, who was an acknowledged music industry wizard best known for making the career of Whitney Houston, Dionne Warwick, among others, even having a hand in Aretha Franklin's success. We played him some of the tracks that we'd made at Motown, particularly Indestructible. Clive loved the song and made a deal with Motown to acquire the tracks. He released it under Arista's label. Yeah, because the Clive had the money. Okay, you know you can't just, you know, Barry Gordy ain't just going to let you walk away. You know that, or you're going to have to pay, just like pimps, baby. I know you like, nay, everything is about pimping and hoeing. Girl, life is about pimping and hoeing. You're okay. applying for jobs, baby, you choose of course. Okay. Barry Gordy is a pimp, all right? The the four tops, they the hoes. They don't like the way Barry the Gordy is, is, is handling their affairs right now. So they out. They see the Clive Davis. Clive Davis, I'm choosing tonight, baby. Clive Davis say, okay, okay, okay. All right, well, you know how this is. When you knock a pimp, you got to pay. Clive paid Barry. But believe this, the four tops had to pay the Clive. Get it? I choose you, baby. Choosing never, never fuck without a rub. Despite Clive's best efforts promoting Indestructible, something about that song just didn't hit. Our relationship with Arista was a good one. However, after being on so many different labels, Chess, Columbia, Riverside, Motown, ABC, Dunhill, Casablanca, and finally Arista, it was the last record deal we ever had. I choose you, baby. We were notified that the four tops had been voted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. An act can't be put on the ballot until 25 years after their first record. And we were put on the ballot 25 years after the release of our first hit record in 1964. We were told that the vote among our peers had been unanimous which felt wonderful. I didn't know that. You learn something new every day. I didn't know you couldn't get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame unless you've been in the business for 25 years. I mean, I, I mean, that's something to aim for. That recognition from our fellow artists helped us reconnect with what we knew in our hearts. Something we'd lost sight of when the record execs told us we had no more value. We were loved and appreciated. Our loyal fans all over the world would pay to hear us perform. We went back on the road touring, giving concerts, booking engagements, and singing in front of live audiences. Something we loved doing and had done from the very beginning. Piper had been after me to stop my drinking for quite a while. She was always like an angel on my shoulder, but I didn't take her advice right away. Promising that I'd stop when the time was right, Finally, one night I came home drunk and she confronted me.
already done so please remember to like share the facebook subscribe and visit up top beauty my wood bangle bundles because they're not selling i think i'm going to lower the price on them and then mix up the colors a bit you know i would love to keep the colors the same but i mean real talk i i got some things i gotta do and i need the money